All right. There we are. Okay, there we here are. We're, Looks like we're live. Another episode of Uncertain Dots so, with uh, Rhett Elaine and I'm Chad Orzel. <laughs> I think it's always important to say who you are because you just never know who's going to watch. And they may say, hey, I don't know That's who right. that joker is. Could be anybody. Could be random people on the internet. Those, That's right. Uh, well, those are kind of the best. Random certain dots. Yeah. For, for whatever reason. But I don't know. So I'm so, I'm pretty pretty wiped from doing uh, tours. Uh, yesterday we had an admissions event, so we had hundreds of prospective students. And I had to give tours to a bunch of bunch of them, and then today we got a visitor candidate. So. Lots and lots of showing people around the department. Do you have any cool labs with the really cool experiments you can show them that's like the wow factor? Or or do you kind of have to say, well, you know? We've got we've got a, a particle accelerator and a fairly big telescope. So uh, that works. those two things, you know, we got a one megavolt, um, which is, you know, in the nuclear physics world is pretty small, but you know, it's a great big thing. It takes up a whole room. Um, and uh, so, you know, they do a lot of experiments with that. And that's a that's a unique thing for a school our size. A um, lot, of, lot of state universities, you know, that sort of scale of institution have those. But um, smaller but large colleges generally don't. So we, we talk that up quite a bit. And we've got a telescope that's a 20-inch telescope. So, you know mirror yay big around and um, that's you know that's in an observatory dome up on the top of one of the the many science buildings and so that's always we, nice to show people we don't have a lot of great things to show because we do a lot I mean like our our physics we're mostly theoretical or computational um, just because the way we hire people um, you know it's always easier to hire um, not experimental person, um, so we, we fall we, we fall short in the experimental area in physics because they're they're expensive, and they take yeah. up a lot of space. Um, but they're also really great to have, and they're great for students because there's great things that they can do. You know, even if it's not, if just building things or making things work or running things, that that's a great it's a great thing for them to get experience with. Um, but uh, we, yeah, we do have chemists, so yeah, the things that that. Are you know? Are, are the thing that's tricky is people who do pencil and paper theory have a hard time uh, because you know if you're going to do uh, theory where you're going to you're going to develop equations for things, you, then you need a lot of background to to be able to contribute meaningfully to that. It's hard for them to to work with students at a small place. Um, I have a, a couple of colleagues who do computational theory, and that's actually fairly easy to get students involved in because you know you can teach them to do bits of programming very early on and and they can do meaningful you know push the code forward a little bit in a meaningful way that um, even without having a huge background in math you know I, I one of the things I've seen undergrads do in computational that I'm you know I understand that it's always hard to jump in but I, I never like when it's it's some type of black box that they're running, some type of black box code where they're just putting in parameters and getting the output and then, you know, seeing what happens. I understand that you got to do that. But uh, to me, um, I, I just, I just, I don't know. It just doesn't, doesn't seem, it's, it's sort of the same as pushing the buttons on, a, on an experimental apparatus, but I don't know, for the computational thing, it just seems like they could do something. If they're writing the code or changing the code, I like that, but... Yeah, and I don't think we don't we don't have people doing a lot of that, but it's you know the, the students are writing routines to simulate particular uh, particular areas of physics and you know and exploring different regions of parameter space. But you know it's a little it's it's a little if you're telling somebody, um, you know here are some here are the equations that govern this process. Code that into a computer and run that I think that works that works pretty well and, and you know they don't necessarily have to know the, you know huge amounts about how those equations come right. about um, whereas you know if you're doing if you're generating those equations 
you know, a lot of times you need you need to know, you know, symmetry properties of vector spaces and and that kind of thing. And that's you know, that's stuff that they don't pick up in math classes until they're you know, they're juniors. And so it's it's really hard for, for students to, to contribute to that in a in a meaningful way. I think the nice hard thing, thing, you know, experimental projects. The nice thing is I can always have people, you know, frequently have people you know, build something. You know, like we, we need a, you know, I need a new laser. You know, that that's got to have a mount, and that's got to have, uh, you know, temperature controllers and current controllers, and those are all things that you can. Uh, you know, you can go in the machine shop and make an aluminum piece to hold it, and um, you know, and and putting that together and testing it and that that stuff that that's um, perfect work for undergraduates. Yeah, it works really well. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I think that the the biggest problem a lot of faculty have with undergraduate research is to, I mean, you got to I think you have to first say undergraduate research is part of the learning process, and you can't say I'm going to do undergraduate research and you know. Um, advance science as, as much as you are learning about science. It's really, it's really kind of like a class. Um, you yeah. Know, if, you, if you go in and say we're going to win the Nobel Prize with undergraduate research, that's probably not going to happen. It could, but it's probably not. Yeah, and and that's the thing that that you know sometimes struggle to get people from other disciplines to understand, and that uh, you know not not other sciences, but people from outside the sciences sometimes think like, well, you've got all these students helping you, you know, like. And they're really making it worse. <laughs> so, you know, we're helping them. It's like, right. you know, I, I have had days where I've, on, on a couple of occasions, I've told my, my research student, go home because this thing is broken and fixing it is going to take you a week and I will have it done when you come in in the morning. You know, if you just leave, I can fix this and it will be working tomorrow. And if I try to explain to you how to fix it and have you do it, you would learn something. You would learn how to fix that thing. But it will just take so much longer. It will be incredibly frustrating for everybody. Just go home. I'll fix it. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. It's sort of like cleaning the house with a three-year-old. Yeah, the three-year-old wants to help, but you can get a lot done faster if you just do it yourself. Yeah. yeah but it's good started... for the three-year-old to learn about these things and uh, – so that when the three-year-old becomes a thirteen-year-old, they can they can clean the house. Yeah, yeah. So we we have uh, Steely Kid has has recently started wanting to do chores to earn points toward getting toys, and so so she you know she helps clear the table after dinner, and and it's like you know brings you know two forks over and puts them in the dishwasher and then brings one plate over and puts it in the dishwasher and then and then another plate. And like if you stack the plates up, you could bring all of the plates at one time and, and this would go faster. But it's like, no, that's not the point. The point is for her to learn about responsibility and helping out and and that kind of thing. But you know, it would go I'm still, faster. I'm still trying to uh, transition into the children mowing the grass, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. They can they can almost do it. You know, my oldest daughter is uh, almost 14, and my my son's 12. But you know, the Louisiana grass and the and the it's just a really it's really thick, and so you you actually have even with the self-propelled mower, you still have to push a lot, and so it's a it's it's still pretty tough. So yeah, I don't know, maybe maybe soon. Yeah, we got like the you know the the the, the green you know uh, pure push mower with the just the the spinning. Oh, I love those. Blades. Those are awesome. They weigh a ton. Yeah, yeah. And those and cool. you have to sharpen them like every third time you use it. But, <laughs> but uh, now we 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 pay uh, pay a colleague's teenage kids to to mow our lawn, which used to used to be our next door neighbors, but their kids all. Graduated from high school, moved away, so it's hard to hard to find good help. Yeah, I mean, I, I just do mine my myself, and it it's just a little big for a push mower, but I, I use a push. It's a self propelled push mower, but uh, yeah. you still got to push it. I mean, it and then in the middle of the summer, it you know you got to do it every four days or something. It just gets out of control. But now's the nice time. It's nice weather. The grass is easy. 
Uh, you don't have to do it so often. It's it's like, yay, I get to mow the grass. Yeah. So. See, we're we're we still haven't gotten to that stage. We actually yesterday was like seventy five to eighty degrees here. Today it's sixty and pouring rain. And uh, tomorrow, the overnight low is supposed to get down into the 20. So, and the chance of snow flurries tomorrow. So, spring in New England. I mean, the only bad thing down here is the pollen. Um, yeah. So. We had, we had an admissions open house yesterday, and I did a little presentation for them. I started off by saying, you know, how many of you have traveled more than two hours to get here? You know, a whole bunch of hands go up, and I say the weather is always like this because it was 75 and sunny. I'm like those of you who live close by, shh, don't, don't tell them. I, I'll, overall, I'm I'm pretty happy with the the weather in, in Louisiana. I mean, the summers are hot, but you know that doesn't last forever, and you can still do things. Uh, yeah. So I'm happy. Yeah, and hey, you got air conditioning. Yeah, it makes it right. makes it tolerable. Yeah, but so what about what do you think about um, student evaluations? Because uh, we're about to do that here. What's your opinions of, of student evaluation? evaluation? You know, so the 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 thing that uh, a senior colleague told me, someone from another department said once that I've adopted that works really well is when I hand out the evaluations, I'll say. Okay, I did. You know, here are some things I did this term that are different than what I've done in the past. I would like your feedback on these things, and I'll I'll write a list on the board that you know, like this year, you know, doing more whiteboard you know, activities in class, um, V Python programming, um, you know, web assigned homework, uh, standards based grading. I'll say you know these are things that are different. I would like your feedback on those. And then I actually get, um, you know, not not great uh, input, but I get somewhat more thoughtful comments uh, about it. And if I just say, "Here's the forms, fill them out," you know what to do. Then I get a lot of you know one-word answers to things. You know, a question, you know, like the uh, instructor's ability to stimulate discussion of the material was, you know, just write okay, like, you know, that's. I mean, do you have an open-ended form and a multiple-choice thing, or, or how does it work there? We have these forms that have um, they have numerical responses on a zero to five scale yeah. uh, for it's like twelve or fourteen questions, and then okay. each of those questions has a little box after it where you can write in whatever you you know where where they can write in stuff, um, and we now get them. They scan them, and we get uh, summaries of the numerical scores, and we also get uh, a PDF file with images of each of those boxes um, that has anything written in it. If it picks up any kind of uh, marking in the box, it'll scan it and paste it into the PDF. So where the main thing that I've learned is that our students have really, really terrible handwriting because because I'm department chair now, so I get to look at everybody's evaluations. And I, get to. I, in fact, have an obligation to look at <laughs> evaluation. Uh, it's like, um, you know, I think that there's two aspects of the the evaluations from the students. You know, one is this, what you're saying, feedback on things. And I think that's useful. I think it's useful for them, too, to get, uh, you know, feedback on what works and what doesn't work and stuff like that. The, the problem I have that with the student evaluations is when they're used to uh, evaluate faculty. I don't think that's very valid. Um, but uh, and and then the on top of that, the types of questions they ask. You know, I think whatever the questions they ask. You know, ours are on a zero to five scale too, and the university average score is like four point five. So yeah. you know, you, you, that's not statistically meaningful. Any score that you get, you can't get above average essentially. And everyone's you know the average should be three or whatever. And everyone's above that, so it's it's a it shows you that the students aren't really answering it the way they they probably should. Um, we have a question on ours that says uh, one of the questions that I focus on is instructor starts and ends class on time, and and I am very careful about starting exactly on time and ending exactly on time. And so for me, that's not an opinion anymore. It's a 
it's a true or false statement, right? And yeah. so I would, I, I know the answer. I do start in in class one time, but I don't get sixes or fives or the highest score, whatever it is. Yeah. And and so I think the students are really treating it as just, you know, do you like this person? I'm going to answer all these questions. Do I like that person or not? Which isn't yeah. isn't bad, but it's not it's not the I mean, my job's not for people to like me either. So. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough thing because you know, you need some sort of evaluation, and the problem is there's so much variation in the, the ways people do things, right? I, I've got I I have colleagues who you know primarily do a traditional lecture sort of thing. They stand and they write on the blackboard and they you know they they give a prepared talk. I have. I have one colleague who's going the, the flipped class route. He records lectures on video, posts them on the web, and then just uses class time to answer questions uh, and, you know, go over problems. Um, you know, there's people who do uh, everything in between. We had a, a visitor who, who did a great job with whiteboards with, you know, the, like, zero lecture sort of thing. He would sort of pose questions and have students develop equations on their own and then occasionally, you know, occasionally interject, okay, so, you know, so we need to include this additional factor that wouldn't be obvious to you, but you've, you know, you've come up with most of the expression for momentum. Um, you just need to add this little relativistic piece. And, and um, there's such a range of stuff that people do. You got to have some way to try and, you know, try and compare people, you know, are they, they doing a good job or not? And so it's a hard problem. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the evaluations are really, uh, they're, they're not incredibly valuable. For, for me, the, the evaluations do one thing. They say whether the, if the scores are very high or very low, then it says, hey, maybe you should go look at this class. Um, if the scores are very high, that may be good, that may be bad. I don't know. It could be bad. It could be a bad sign if the scores are really high or really low. And so, but, you know, really the evaluation for me would have to be, you have to have another faculty member actually observe that class or, or talk to the faculty or something like that. The, the, uh, the students are just one piece of evidence. The student evaluation is just one piece of evidence that, that you would get. Um, yeah, when we do, when we do uh, reappointment reviews and tenure reviews for um, for, for faculty. So we have a, a review after the third, uh, a review in the third year, and then um, the tenure review at, after six years. The um, then we we actually do, you know, somebody observes the class. Um, somebody, you know, the the review committee interviews a large number of randomly selected students and, you know, talks to them directly. They solicit letters from people who took the classes in the past. You know, they go out and they aggressively gather more information than just those evaluation comments. Uh, yeah, I think going in the, in the looking at students that took in the past and, and evaluating analysis not part of the course at all, it's clearly separated from the course, is yeah. a really good idea. You know, I think... I mean, there's a sense in which sometimes it's more valuable because sometimes there are students who are a little disgruntled about, you know, yeah, this course was really hard and why are we doing this, you know, why are we doing this stupid thing? And then a couple years later we'll say, you know, you know that was actually really valuable. I'm right. Glad that, I'm glad that that happened and, that, you know, that we, we talked about this thing. Um, and then, you know, a little perspective sometimes gives them more insight than they have when they're, you know, they think they're going to get a bad grade and it's the last week of class and they're all grumpy um, and they're they're you know writing anonymous comments. So, and they're trying uh, to get so I do think that that there's some value to that. They tend to be very repetitive. Is the thing that happens? You know, I've sat on one of these review things and you know interviewed. I only interviewed a, a fraction of the total number of students. I interviewed five or six. It's just like the, it's the same thing over and over and over. They all say the same things, and you know, every once in a while you get somebody who says something different. But you know, they 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 all tend to give you the same picture. But then that that in itself is sort of valuable. That you know, if they're all consistent, then that tells you something. And if you've got people who are all over the map, then, you know, 
then that's that's probably cause for concern. You know what I find? I think I think student feedback, in some level, is very important. It's just that I don't always think it's completely valid to to use it for an evaluation of the faculty. But you know, I'll I'll take like uh, sheets of paper like this, and and I'll just let students say write something on there, mm -hmm. either a question or something that you're not clear about, and and then turn it in. Don't put your name, and you can write whatever you want. And they do, and they put things like you know um, this particular topic is really clear. Could you go over this? Um, you know, or make sure you tuck in your pants when you or your shirt into your pants or whatever they want to say, they can say it, and then they can have that feedback. And I think that's really uh, useful because sometimes it's hard to gather to to determine what the students are thinking about in class because um, if they don't talk, well, I've, had some, I've had some that weren't entirely serious, and uh, so I had a student course comment one time that was, uh, you know, other student in the class is the worst Warcraft player ever. Yes. That might be important. <laughs> okay, thank thank you for writing that on my evaluation forms as I come up for tenure. Like that's that's really gonna help me. Well, that was the one I got actually on my real evaluations was, um, if you if you tuck in your shirt, wear a belt. But if you don't tuck in your shirt, then you can wear a belt or not wear a belt. And I'm like, well, that's just nice and helpful about the class. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's okay. <laughs> well, th this past term I got. Uh, He's pretty chill from two different students. <laughs> okay, I guess. Two different students. Two different students used the word used the phrase pretty chill. They might have cheated on their evaluation. That's possible. <laughs> oh, I'm not quite sure why anybody would do that. <laughs> well, they could do it. <laughs> I've I've also had ones that like I I had a disastrous uh, lab section of the uh, life sciences course several years ago now um, and somebody wrote uh, he called me a corporate tool and another person wrote he called my friend a corporate tool and I'm like and I know exactly what prompted it which is I wrote on a couple of papers I actually used to use this all the time um, I say you know writing utilize where use would suffice makes you sound like a corporate tool Oh, you didn't call him a corporate tool. I didn't call him a corporate tool. No. But what you know, what went on to the, the you know, how did they interpret it? They interpreted it as you are a corporate tool. I'm like, you know, like I'm saying, you sound like the, you know, you're you're using big words for no reason, and that you come off like the pointy-haired boss in Dilbert. He called me the pointy-haired boss in Dilbert. He called my friend the pointy-haired boss in Dilbert. Exactly. So. <laughs> So I've stopped writing that on on papers. But, um, I, I'll still write that on you know physics major papers. If students who I know, um, I, that I can get away with that. Uh, I used to be able to get away with that with that with a wider range of people. And, in terms and of student writing, students at the moment. I have to say that in terms of student writing, I I, I don't want to point fingers, but I have a, a feeling that. Some people are telling the students to use those bigger words also. It makes you sound better. Use use utilize instead of just use because, you know, it's too simple to write use. I, I think in other departments, maybe, okay, yeah. that they are encouraging them to do that. I know um, I, another one that drives me nuts is uh, bio and chem tell them explicitly to write in the passive voice, um, and I hate that. Uh, uh, like. You know the the apparatus was set up using a hook. I'm like, so it was set up by who? Like elves? Like you set it up? So, you know, like just write. We set up the apparatus this way, and then you're taking credit for it. It's shorter. You don't have these sort of tortured, you know, structures that you end up with when you're trying to do passive voice. Just you know. Um, I agree with you. I, I'm I'm much more in favor of uh, informal writing styles because it's not about the words; it's about the ideas. And I think that's what you're trying to say too. It's it's the idea that you want to get across and how we communicate that. We don't have to wear a suit and tie to communicate that. If you're wearing a Grateful Dead T-shirt, you can still say the same thing. And it, you know, the suit and tie would be utilized, right? And that that using those bigger words. We don't have to do but, that. You know, and there's there's a there's a place for for a lot of these words, but 
because a lot of times, you know, students will will reach for a big word but not quite understand it. So like, I'm sure you get you get this all the time with uh, um, any anything that's not a straight line. Some students will describe as exponential. Right? You know, this is you know like like what's the function here? Like, oh, it's an exponential. Like, no, exponential has a very precise meaning. You know, it's it actually is, a, it's, it's a trig function. <laughs> it's a particular function. You know, this is not this is a parabola. This is not an exponential. It it goes like x squared. Okay, that's not exponential. And or you know, one over x. They'll describe it as exponential. Like, no, it it's not. You know, exponential means a very specific thing. And there, I don't know what the specific use. You know where where utilize is valuable. I, I've never figured out. A well, it makes the paper longer, and if you're going by page length, then yeah, that well, everyone has a shade of meaning that's useful. But but you know there are a lot of the words that they're they're going for are words that if you really know what you're doing would be appropriate for describing some very specific effect. But they sort of grab them for things that aren't the right. You know, I also I, like I have a colleague who talks about um, makes a big point of doing a lab where it looks at the difference between linear and proportional because you can have you know an intercept or not whether you, you have know, a, a zero like intercept. proportional has an intercept of zero right and 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 linear does not necessarily and they they're both linear relationships but one of them is is different than the other and and trying to get Get proportional is linear. Yeah, proportional is linear, but but linear is not proportional. Right. Necessarily. Right. So. So you know, there's shades of of meaning there. The other, the one that messes me up, we'll, we'll get students who are very good, clear, clearly very good writers, in a different context, um, but they they'll do things like, uh, like changing up the words that they use to refute re refer to things. All right. Time. And you know, like like trying to find different ways to talk about the same piece of the apparatus like so that they're not and using. Then they'll say a spherical object, and then they'll say a bouncy thing or whatever. Yeah, and, and it's like no, you just pick one thing and just call it that all the way through. Like don't don't. You know, if it's a ball at the beginning, it's a ball in the middle, and it's a ball at the end. It's not a ball and then a spheroid and then a. But again, you're right. I think in in when they take uh, you know literature classes and they're writing, that is a, you do not want to do that. You don't want to keep saying ball, exactly. ball, ball, ball. Um, you want to you know that's not artistic, and and so but the, it is important for the students to realize the difference between writing as as a you know artistic endeavor and writing. To convey information, which is what we do in science. Yeah, and so you know, it's a very different different format, and I don't, know, you know, I'm not sure that they get out of the uh, lit. You know, we have people who think that they should be learning all of their writing in the English department, and I'm not sure that that's, you know, effective. That I don't, I don't know that people are actually getting that. No, they they should be learning to write by writing. And yeah. it should just be in the English. And and uh, this is you know we shouldn't compartmentalize learning. It should be everything is everywhere. You know you should do reading and writing and science, and you should do math and science, and you should do you can do science and the history of science and history. You can do everything everywhere. You know, uh, and this is what bothers me when kids say, "Well, I'm not a I'm not a math person. I'm a I'm a writing person." And uh, you know, I'm saying, well, no, you're you're a person, person. You do all those things. Yeah, you can, you you ought to be able to do all of those things. Yes. So, and yeah, and th those things get treated very differently. And I've had, you know, I, I complained about students in not wanting to do math, and I said, you know, we don't do the same. You know, we bend over backwards to offer classes that don't have any math in them uh, that convey some science content. You know, but we, you know, we don't do the same thing. We don't do special classes that are aimed at with no with girls. no words. <laughs> you, know, you, you aren't happy with reading, you know, literary criticism. They say, well, you know, if they're not comfortable reading art literature, they shouldn't come here. Like, like if they don't want to do math, they shouldn't come. Here. Right? No, I agree. So, like the point of a liberal education is you do a little bit of everything, 
and that includes math and science. They could do a science class without without words by having comic books instead of a textbook. <laughs> what do you think about that? There's no reading involved. You just look at the pictures. <laughs> pictures. So, <laughs> I mean, you could do that. You could you could maybe do that, but yeah. I don't know. The uh, yeah, it's a it's a hard problem, but. Maybe a solution for another day. Yeah, I don't know. If I, 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 I keep toying with the idea of that, that we ought to do, like, uh, I've written about this on the blog, that we ought to have some, um, you know, poetry for physicists classes to as a counterpart to the physics for poets. You know, I agree. Where, you know, you try, and, um, you try and convey the less, the things that you want students to take away from those classes in a manner that's more congenial to science students because you know the there are there are all, I've had a lot of advising meetings with students who are like why do I have to take this like this is a waste of my time and, and it's like I think it's it's partly because it's being framed the wrong way they, they find it confusing and and disturbing and you know, would be better off having that same material presented in a different way. But, um, yeah. but you know, it's one of the, the umpteen things that I don't have time to to actually put any serious effort into because I'm reading everybody's course evaluations. And, That's true. And giving that giving tours to a whole bunch of, of kids. So, which is fine. You know, I, I actually enjoy the, the tour giving. I mean, that's... That's a good deal of fun. I get to you know show people around, talk about the cool stuff that we that we have. And, uh, but but man, is that tiring? Cause oh yeah, you it wears you out. It's fun, but it wears you out because it's yeah, it does. I agree. And then the other the other problem with it is you know we we have our our offices are on the third floor of the science and engineering building. The um, the labs are are in the research labs are in the basement because you know we have sensitive electronics and, and optics and things, so you want that to be vibrationally stable and you want to be able to make the room dark, so that's got to be in the basement in a windowless room. And then we have the observatory, which is on the, the roof of a, a different building, so, you know, so we go, like, go down a whole bunch of stairs and over into another building and then up a whole bunch of stairs to get to, you know, so it's a, it's a tour with a, with a significant change in elevation as well. Tour with exercise. Moving through all three dimensions yeah. of space. So. Okay, well, I think that's about 30 minutes. We did it once yep. again every every week. Okay. It's like, hey, can we just not have an agenda and actually talk? And we do. And it actually works. Yeah. So. I didn't even I didn't even rant about comic book movies. So. Oh yeah, good because that was the blog that topic. Been bad, that would have been bad because I like comic book movies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, are you going to anyway? Expected. Okay. <laughs> I just don't. I just, I'm just not invested enough in the characters to to get past the fact that you know. You didn't read comic books when you were younger. I never really got into comic. They they okay. never it never seemed cost effective to me. Yeah. Because you know you you were paying like uh, you know. A dollar. You're paying like a dollar for something that would take 15 minutes to read, and yeah. whereas for five dollars I could get something that would take me. You know, two hours to read, and that was a, you know, if I, you know, I bought a paperback for five bucks, that was going to keep me entertained longer than than the comic book for a dollar. Okay, so I mean, I, I think one of the things that made it more cost effective for me is I had two brothers, so we could all read it. Right. So if you inherit a lot of, you know, an extensive collection of them from somebody else, then you know you got a lot of material to work through for free. Yeah. Right. And then, and then that gets you invested in the right. in the characters, and then you know, then you want to know what happens next. So, well, maybe we'll talk about uh, physics and superheroes next week. Maybe that'd be good. Yeah, that that could be good. Unless we'll we change our mind, about... we could do that. Too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, something else comes up. <laughs> so, so, well, good luck with your with your course evaluations. All right. Well, you too. So, okay.